Hey, welcome to the Horse Hour podcast. I'm Amy Stevenson. Have you ever seen somebody mountain boarding behind the back of a horse via a rope whilst the horse is galloping around poles? It's incredible. It's called Horse Boarding UK. And today we speak to the founder, Daniel Fowler Prime, about how he came up with the idea and how horse boarding is taking the equestrian industry by storm. This is Horse Hour. Today we're talking about a new kind of equestrian sport. I like to think of it as the equestrian sport for adrenaline junkies. And I'd like to introduce Daniel Fowler Prime, who's the founder of Horseboarding UK. How are you, Daniel? Oh, I'm very good, thank you. This is so exciting. I saw you, you've, you know, horseboarding has been around for quite a few years now. What is it, eight years? Uh, yeah, well, it's been through several uh, points of evolution, really, from uh, the very first idea, which was back in 2004, to the first competition in 2008 and then really went through a little bit of a development stage up until about 2013 when we started Horseboarding UK. Well I only heard about it for the first time this year and uh, I was lucky enough to go along to one of your events in Hampshire and it is the coolest sport I've ever seen. It's so much fun. (laughs) Can you briefly describe to us what horseboarding is? Yeah well the the simplest form is you have a horse, a horse rider and a guy or girl on a mountain board or an off-road skateboard which race around a twisting turning course in the fastest time possible. So it's like it's basically skateboarding around the back of a horse isn't it? Yes um, (laughs) (laughs) um, don't go and do that literally at home Um, go skateboarding around the back of your horse but yeah basically it's it's uh you, you you are um, racing your team, which consists of your your three elements: the horse rider, the horse, and the and the board rider, um, around a course against the clock. So you can see some of the videos of of the championships that we went to last month. Uh, if you head to our website horsehour.co.uk and head to your website, which is horseboardinguk.org, and um, you can see some of the teams that are taking part. Because to be quite honest. I don't think you really understand it until you see what it's like and you get the atmosphere. It's a very fun, uplifting, engaging sport. And it, and it brings the fun back into equestrianism, I think. Well, that's a, a wonderful comment. Thank you. <laughs> well, no, it was. I mean, it got my adrenaline going because I'm thinking, gosh, not only have you got the power of the horse and the skill of the rider who has to be able to manoeuvre a bit like, how can I explain it, Jim Connors. So they have to go mm-hmm. around like slaloms. Behind them is then the skill and the balance of the board rider and uh, and what's so lovely watching them was that they actually work as a team so they're talking to each other all the time which direction they're going to go to but um we'll talk about that more in detail in a bit i'm fascinated to know how did you first come up with the idea well my background is working with horses in in film and tv um so i put that as as being an environment where pretty much anything's possible so somebody it's not (laughs) it's not a question of you can't do that with a horse it's how can you how can you make that situation happen as opposed to being in an environment which is very uh, controlled um and uh, you know like normal equestrianism um and which is all which is all built on rules that have been set up for a very long time mm. so i was also a keen skater and a keen surfer and pretty much anything i could stand on so being in the two sorts of uh, environments it was only a matter of time before i thought could i put the surfing and the, and the skateboarding and and mountain boarding together with the horse and if if we did do it what would that mean and um what could we do with it from then on in so um the first sort of scenario was at the time i was doing an awful lot of trick riding which a lot of people will call stunt riding but there are some some differences but if you've seen any of the stunt teams that work around the country doing cossack shows or wild west shows I've pretty much worked for, for all of them uh, in this country at some point or another. And what you would do is you would run from one corner of the arena to the other corner of the arena, jump on and off the horse, stand on the horse, hang off the horse, pick hats up off the ground. Gymnastics at a gallop, basically. So mm. um, initially, when we first worked out that we could tie a board onto the back of a horse and the horse would be OK with it, was to do that as a part of the show. So we would basically do I would do a trick where I would just run the horse loose across the arena uh, and he would run from one corner to the other corner and I'd tow along behind him on a board. And then uh, along with that, sometimes I'd pick hats up or whatever, assuming I didn't fall off, which did happen a lot. <laughs> but bear with, bear with, is this is this with a rider or without a rider? No, this was, this was without a rider. That's so, even more insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the thing, what, the thing was, when you're training a, a stunt horse like that to do those sorts of tricks, 
what you really teach them to do is to start from point A, being one corner of the arena, and run to the, the opposite corner on a diagonal line. And the way in which the horse works is that they pay no attention to what the horse rider is doing. Mm. So instead of normally, if you're sitting on a horse, you're giving the horse signals when you're riding and so on and so forth. Obviously, they needed to have that skill as well because you need to be able to ride them. But when you let them go, what they needed to learn then at that point was to compensate for weight and do everything else. As a trick rider, when you're hanging off the side of the horse, you have no control over what the horse is doing. The horse mm. is doing it and you have to trust the horse to to run from one point to the other and keep yourself balanced. So taking the rider out of that equation, once you've got the horse going, wasn't too much of a difficult jump because you're still with the horse and you know you, you can be anywhere around the vicinity of them. And they'll still run because he, he knows that I've got to run from here to there and stop. Mm. Uh, and that's his job. That's his main focus. Um, he will, of course, the horse will, of course, learn the tricks that you're doing and compensate for those. And certainly, particularly they're heavy or whatever. Um, but yeah, and uh, my horse particularly was very good at hats. So um, mm. people said I was very good at hats. But the thing was, the horse always used to put me on top of the hat. So <laughs> so, <laughs> <helpful. laughs> so I guess you've got to really build up a good trust bond and relationship with your horse. We often see these trick riders and I think, oh, you're throwing yourselves around and it's not the soft and gentle way that we're used to seeing in, dress in dressage or equestrianism. But I guess you are quite, you must be quiet and calm with your training. Yeah, they have to learn, the, the horses have to learn the tricks as much as the rider has to learn the trick. So, the uh, and horses will even learn your routine. So if you've got a number, if you're doing five or six tricks in a show and you're working with that horse all the time, they will, they'll know, okay, the first trick he's going to do this and they'll compensate for that and so on and so forth. What you don't want to do, and also as well, it's about your movement. So you've got to move in a controlled manner, a bit more like a gymnast than, than just throwing a lead weight off the side of the horse. Because if you just throw your weight off the horse, you will interrupt their running. You know, whereas mm. if you control your weight and, and how you move, then the horse can compensate for that and, and still run straight. A friend of mine came and had some lessons with you. You don't, you don't even know this. Um, she was telling no, me about, she's been telling me for ages that she, she took her horse and went um, a trick riding, went for a trick riding week. And okay. it wasn't until I brought her with me to watch Horse Boarding UK. She said, that's who I had my lessons with. And no joke, Ruby has been banging on about her trick riding for years. <laughs> and she said she'd love to get back into it. And she was mesmerized with the balance the skill uh, it's about mm -hmm. the rhythm of the horse and and how much inner strength she needed to be able to keep herself on top of the of top of the horse i mean jimmy's a thoroughbred we know he can run but but to have that control was pretty immense with, from what she was saying anyway mm. yeah well i mean it, it does open a whole new aspect of riding really in, in an understanding your horse and your horse's movements uh, it's all very well if you're on if you're riding a horse uh, and even a, a you know a good dressage rider and you you can feel how the horse is moving but as a trick rider you need to be hanging off the side of them and still knowing how they're moving mm -hmm. and still at a gallop so that if you do if they do trip or something like this you'll know they've tripped before they're actually going to to fall over if you like so if they trip themselves, you can actually get back into the saddle and support them and lift them back up and make sure that you don't fall. Um, but that, and it gives you a heightened awareness of your of your horse's movements. Uh, it doesn't mean you can do a dressage test, but it means you can hang off. <laughs> Anyone that does a sport like this, and I think I, I, I believe it's the same with polo, I believe it's the same with racing, I think anything where there's a, a, a huge amount of speed. I mean, you guys are going up to 28, 30 miles an hour. I think you're incredibly brave. I mean, you're brave to be throwing yourself off the side of a horse anyway, but... What was lovely from, from watching the horse boarding is that you have amateur riders that um, are not, you know, high level competitors in any way. There was a father and a daughter there where the daughter was, I think she was about 11 and the dad was was mountain boarding off the back. And it was the training and the, the teaching the horse, teaching the father, teaching the daughter to ride all together. And it was really lovely to see that you don't have to be an exceptional rider to be able to to do this. I mean, what what kind of caliber of riding do you need? I mean, you need to be able to you need to be comfortable riding at speed. You need to have be able to walk, trot, canter. Obviously, you need to be comfortable having the reins in one hand for when you're doing your quick releases of the handle and of the rope. The rope isn't actually tied onto the saddle, is it? It's 
Can you explain the connection of the quick release? Yeah, we developed a harness which fits on a normal English saddle, which you can order from Horseboarding UK. And so this works, goes through the gullet and around the tree of the saddle. And on the back, it gives you a, a, a big D ring. And then the horse rider wears a belt with another D ring on it. And there's a three pin panic release connected to that the D ring that's on the horse rider. And then a snap shackle connected onto the D, which is on the saddle. So you've got like what we call the leash. Mm. And then onto, onto the snap shackle is connected another panic release for the handle. So when you want to, as you're riding around and you want to release your, release your board rider, you, quit, you grab your, your belt with your three pin panic release, snap that down, pull your arm to the side. And that will release the snap shackle on the back so the handle comes completely loose. Obviously, you can't have two hands on the reins and do that at the same time. Mm-hmm. And also what this system means is that if the horse rider should fall off, is that as the horse rider comes away from the horse, then the uh, snap shackle will automatically release so that you don't end up with a situation where a horse is running around with a handle behind it, mm-hmm. you know, and people are trying to catch it and things like this. So it'll just come away. Um, and the horses free them. That's brilliant because I mean they would freak out surely if they had something flying. Oh, well, I'm saying that they're used to things flying around. Behind. Yeah, I mean the thing is when we when we train them, uh, so we run training courses regularly all over the country for people who are interested in it, in bringing their horses and getting them used to the sport. And and part of that course is teaching the horses to tow a loose handle because what we found years ago is that we found we had a particular horse that we taught to to tow took to it lovely until the first time a board rider fell off and then the horse the the rope went loose and it was flapping about and the horse didn't like it Mm. so then we introduced that into the training method so that we explained to the horses that they can have this loose handle and it's not just going to chase behind them there's particular exercises that we use to 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 show them this so when they do crash when a board rider does crash in the arena with or without the horse rider still on if they did have the handle the horse won't react to it Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still a, an added risk that you just don't need to have on the back of the horse. If you can work out a system, which is what we went away and did, work out a system where the horse is just without this extra bit of rope hanging out the back, then it's a lot safer. It's a good idea, and because there are a lot of crashes in terms of the borders, you know, we saw quite mm-hmm. a few falling off. Luckily, riders are good; they tend to stay on. The horses just do their thing. The borders—that's mm. part of the excitement of it, though. Is is they can exactly, fall yeah. off. And also part of the part of the way the rules were written. I mean, uh, the the sport is uh, manufactured to be an, an arena entertainment. So the rules are manufactured in a way which will give entertainment to the audience that's the the way it's meant to be so the reason that it's only your fastest runs that count so within a day certainly in the novice and intermediate you get six attempts at the course um it's only your fastest that counts to encourage the teams to push that little bit faster so that it encourages them to to um, go as fast as they can which invariably leads to a situation where the board riders will come off um and that's what's part of the entertainment value <laughs> being totally honest and they take it very well as well they you know hands up happy to be stood back on their feet again oh yeah and they're all very well padded i mean they the the padded from head to toe in in body armor so that helps it was interesting. I had a lovely chat with Sandy, who's a board rider, and he mm-hmm. said he'd never done board riding before. He'd never done anything like it, but saw the sport and thought, does he do it with his girlfriend? Yes, uh, Sandy and Amy. Well, they both compete, but they compete on different teams most of the time. <laughs> Sounds they, about they right. To- I think it was a relationship management uh, decision. Yeah, <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> in terms of the board riders, what is really interesting is that not all the board riders have previously boarded. So the, some of them have learned to horse board and to ride a board to be towed behind a horse. But some of them, well, all of them have had riding lessons, even if not, even if they hadn't had anything to do with horses before. So, and it's quite interesting to see people who wouldn't normally have anything to do with horses gain a bit of knowledge. I remember the first time I heard one of the, a couple of horse boarders, a couple of board riders were stood, we got a new horse turned up and it was warming up in the arena from a a new team somewhere. And a couple of the board riders were stood by the side of the arena. I just happened to be walking past them. And uh, I heard one of them go, oh yeah, it looks like that'll make a good horse, that one will. And I just thought, when did you guys learn anything about horses? Do you know what I mean? Obviously, towing around the back of them. And now, of course, they all go to the stables. They they help out. They, I mean, they weren't. They're not necessarily. You know, they're a bit more fair weather riders if they ride at all. <laughs> 
And uh, the same with the grooming and, and the mucking out. Obviously, only that needs to be done on a fair weather day just before a competition. But um, this, nevertheless, they do show and, and do become very connected to the horses as well. You know, they are the horses are a very important member of the team. Well, they, and, need to, they need to trust them just as much. And it's really lovely that they are getting that involved with the horses because it's only going to enhance their performance. That they'll, they'll learn where the horse is moving, how he's moving to the side, and they can then anticipate what's going to happen for them to be able to stay on the board, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if the horse has got any particular quirks, like some horses will try and cook the corners a little bit sharp. You know, they might try and go like corner flagging from one gate directly to the next gate, which sometimes the border won't be around the corner. So as much as the horse rider can um, try to compensate, you know, and, and try and keep them off the poles or whatever, um the the board rider also needs to be slightly aware oh my horse is just taking that slightly stride in mm. he's going to cut this corner now i need to try and get in the right angle so that i don't end up coming away from the handle so we wouldn't advise anybody to just go and stick a, a mountain board on the back of a horse and go and have a go because there's so much that goes into the training how do you start training these horses to be able to take a board rider well i mean yes i would i would advise everybody to come along to a training session but it's not to say that people don't train their own their own animals we use a lot of the exercises actually initially in the training that we use when we're working horses in film and tv and it's all about creating an environment that the horse can can move away from if he needs to so one of the main things that we will use in just to you know diversify slightly to, to the to the filming if we've got a horse that's particularly doesn't like loud bangs or doesn't like fire or something like this um we will set let's say uh s somebody um who we've introduced with a shield and a sword in a, in a bit of a field and we'll get somebody to get a horse then to walk around that that person and then we'll start to make noises banging on the shield and so on and so forth now if the horse doesn't like it uh, we allow the horse to step away from that circle but we then bring him back onto the circle and we keep doing this until he's, he's happy on that circle. And eventually we'll bring him into the center and he can, and he'll get a pat from the guy that's banging the shield. And eventually in a short amount of time, you can have the shield on the back of the horse and you can be whacking the hell out of it and the horse won't, won't react. Wow. Um, obviously that's not true for every horse, mm -hmm. but that's, that's a general process. So taking those and we do similar things with fire and um any any scenario that you can come up with but it's about it's not about f at any point with horses in any area it's not about forcing them into it it's about educating them to accept it that it's safe so the same scenario works so the first thing that i do is um a, a horse see the horse obviously say hello in the first place get us on get us on talking terms first and then um I'll have them do the exercise and initially I've just got the rope and I'll just stand there with the rope and the horse, the, the rider walks around. And one of the main things about this is that you don't bring over attention to what it is that you're doing. So we'll have a conversation about the weather or whatever. And it's just a very metronomic conversation. And I'll just be talking. And as I'm talking, I'm playing with the rope and I'm just doing whatever with it. And then eventually I'll ask the horse to come in in a, in a particular way as the horse riders bring the horse in a particular way and stand next to me and stand next to me a little bit of desensitization with the rope over the horse just to make sure there's no tickly spots mm -hmm. um then we'll practice but it's all as, as well making the horse happy that where i am is a safe place to be would long lining help with this because long, it gives long, them experience, obviously. Because long lining teaches them to be ahead of you and to trust yeah. themselves as well as trusting you, and it's okay for you to be behind them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's it's good experience for them. It, this is a different exercise, though, so you have to be. So the rope is the, the reason that we do this with the rope is every horse has seen a rope. You know, sometimes when we do the the, the quick releases, you get that slight little chink of the metal. And sometimes the horses will have a little reaction to that. Um, but really, it's a it's a it's an exercise within an exercise because we're, we're we're playing we're showing them the, a game, and that we're going to move on with later on. So if you do if you start this game with simple things, before you know it, you can build it up the same game and keep changing the thing that you're introducing, so that they can become more and more extreme. Because the horse knows, oh, I know this game. Uh, this must be. I go in a minute. I'm going to go over there next to whatever this great big apparatuses or or whatever this big scary thing is which isn't scary because when i go there i'm going to get a pat so and we just do it that way 
talking on the more extreme level. So once we've got him happy with the, got the horse happy with the the rope, we'll then ask the horse just to walk across the arena in a straight line and just start putting weight on the handle and start pulling on the handle so that the horse starts to engage and, and starts to walk. Some horses will tend to to back off the off the pace and almost mm. stop. Um, so we do say to the horse riders, give them a little bit of leg just to encourage them and talk to him. You know, talk to them, just make sure they go forward. We do that a little bit, go to him, unhook, put the rope down, get the board out. Now, the board, so what we're kind of playing on at this point is that the horse has already played the one game, had a nice experience doing it, and now we're going to play the same game again, but with something that he actually hasn't seen before. So the mounting board, potentially, they've never seen. Also, people forget it's not just about what something looks like, it's about what it does and how you explain to a horse what something is is designed for Hmm. so for example a board on its own isn't a problem if you roll a board randomly through the stable yard none of the horses are going to like it because they don't understand what it is (laughs) you know and it's it's this thing just going on the road so we we show them the board we carry on with our same conversation about nothing and then um (laughs) as the horse is walking around i start to stand on the board i start rolling the board backwards and forwards all the time just checking that the horse has kind of seen it and eventually stand on the board and then eventually be jumping up and down on the board and, and still carrying on the conversation. So the conversation, the horses, what we're not doing is going, oh, look at this, you know, because mm-hmm. this is something important you need to look at. What we're doing is this is a normal bit of life. You just haven't seen it before. And we're just been doing it. Anyway, this takes as long as it takes me to explain it is as long as it takes me to t- show the horse to explain it. Really? So, I would have thought it would yeah, take weeks to get minutes, used to something minutes. Else. Minutes, minutes, minutes. Honestly, it's, the, the horses only, you only need to explain something to a horse once, and they can. Under, if you explain it correctly the first time, they're well away. Again, this is not 100%. Certainly not my horses. horse. I have to explain it every horses. day. <laughs> yeah, there are horses out there that, um, that, that won't help you in this scenario. But, but, and the difference with this as well, compared to a lot of other activities, is that from a horse's point of view, they've never done it before. So they've got no initial reason. They've not had a bad experience with it. Mm -hmm. So as long as you make this first introduction good, then it should be okay. Similarly to when you're teaching horses to joust or or whatever. So not to get, not to diversify too much. (laughs) So you're quite uh, far away, Dan, like you, where are you based? I'm based in Nottingham, but okay. we are we work all over the country. You do work all over, but if if somebody mm. in Wales wanted to bring their horse to you in Nottingham, that's quite far. So, are you available on phone support? Is there ways that you can still help people even if they can't get to you? Um, I am like, yeah, I'm 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 quite happy for people to email me or to give me a call, and I'll discuss these sorts of uh, exercises with them. Um, uh, also, we do have several training centres. So we we have one opening uh, for horse boarding in Chippenham uh, in the very near future. We have another one in Chobham, uh, which is opening later this year. And we have a few. Uh, there, they're going to be the first two that are most likely to start in the in the immediate future. So there, but there are other venues where we can organise things. Great, from. that's good. So yeah. there, there'll be lots of places where we can take our horses to come and have those first few lessons. Yeah, and and also as well, I mean, our training at the moment is very much set up. It's not really have a go. It's set up for people who are genuinely interested in getting involved in the sport. So if you if you if people are interested, then we also run the training days at the venues where we have the competitions. So on the Friday or the Saturday prior to our event, which would be then the Saturday, Sunday or the Sunday, Monday, for example, we're in Burley on the 28th and 29th on the 27th, we have a training day there. And so, you know, if you're going to bring your horse to a to to really get involved in the sport you need to follow the championship or at least be involved with some areas of the championship so you know you've got to be prepared to travel your horse to us so that we can do it so that you can then come on the competitions Mm. oh yeah so you've got to be used to traveling then i guess anyway yeah pretty much at the moment i mean in the future yes we will have local uh, the plan is we'll have local clubs everywhere and local riding centers more more local riding centers running clubs well, that, uh, would but be right good. Now, that would be good because, like, for example, my horse, I'd love to have a go, but my horse isn't, we all know he's got an injury to his right leg. I wouldn't be able to gallop him around an arena. I'd be lucky if I can get a canter out of him, you know, and he's mm-hmm. not strong enough. But I'd love to have a go at this, but I don't have a horse that's suitable. So mm-hmm. at the moment, what do we have to do? Team up with people that we know that have good horses and then maybe at a later date there might be horses available for us to use. Yes, exactly. That's um, that's pretty much where we're going. Um, that might be the case in Chobham, 
relatively quickly. Uh, and that's going to be at the Westcroft Polo Club there. What kind of horses would make a good horse boarding horse? We have all sorts that race. I mean, most horses will take to it. Um, as long as you've got a pretty straightforward horse in terms of he goes when you want, stops when you want, turns when you want, and generally listens to the rider, um, then they will most likely take to horse boarding. Um, in terms of what depends on what you're looking for when you say what's good, what's good and safe. Well, you can have a nice safe cob. You can have a nice. Uh, you can also have unsafe cobs as well. Don't get me wrong. Um, but you can have you can have something that's a simple ride, or you can if you're looking for something good that's going to compete in the elite standard um, as well. We do have a traditional gypsy cob that competes within within the elites, but most of the elite class is made of ex race horses, ex polo ponies, um, sports horses. Uh, but pretty much anything that's got a turn of speed will do it. And the thing is, if you even if you haven't got a turn of speed, you don't have to qualify up into the elite. You can stay in the intermediates and race it at that level. You don't mm. have to go up against the ex-race horses and teams that have been doing it for six, seven years and winning. Well, ponies are great for that, aren't they? Because just like the Gymkhana's, they can, they're really agile. They can move quickly. They can nip around mm-hmm. and... If you do fall off, it's not so far. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the, 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 the welfare that you have for the horses as well. You know, in your list of rules, you've got a whole section on horse welfare. Um, and and what, what do you do to make sure that the horses are safe and looked after? Well, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing uh, thing. And like you say, all those rules are you, you, to be an organisation within a question world. You've got to have horse welfare as a consideration and particularly for something that's as new as this as in every sport or at least there should be you know there is uh, extensive extensive rules of, of w- what you can and can't do and you know making sure that uh, everything everything's okay with the ponies really and you know after the heat typically you have, yeah after the heat <laughs> yeah. you have vets that check them over and just like all the other major sports there's veterinary advice on hand if there's any injuries not that we have many injuries, but, yeah, you know, it's yeah. always about the, the, the safety, the welfare of the horse is, is probably more important than the border and the rider. Because at the end of the day, these teams, they they own their horses. They love for them. Yeah. They care for them. They want to make sure that they're OK. And that, that it's it's about being fun. It's a fun sport that's safe, that's enjoyable. So yeah. your plans then, I mean, it's it's really kicking off now. It's, it's I just think it's an amazing sport i'm so behind it and really excited about it i can't believe actually dan that you've you've been going this amount of time and i've only just heard about it because my other half would love to have a go my dad wants to have a go he can't wait (laughs) and you know even my brother my brother hates horses because they always hurt him but even he said Mm. you know this is a sport that i would be able to enjoy with you as my sister and actually it's exciting Mm -hmm. and 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 it's really yeah it's really fun so what are your plans then like for this year well i mean the thing is it's been trying to grow a sport like this from nothing (laughs) <laughs> mm. is uh, is quite a big challenge it's a bit like trying to start show jumping all over again you know <laughs> you, you know th- thanks thanks to the you know things like the internet and so on and so forth that w- w- you know we're able to get out there uh, reach out to a lot more people and get a lot more coverage than you would if you were a couple of people playing around in a field so for the rest of a uh, year year in year out is to keep just keep pushing forward um we're very keen to bring in new teams um, and develop more methods in terms of like the training centres in which people it's easier for people to come into the sport. Um, it is still very much at the moment our focus is bringing people into the sport to compete within the national championships. Uh, the national championships does go from novice through to elite, and the novices is, is is meant for that in terms of obviously your riding ability has to be uh, walk, trot, canter, and you have to be you have to be you know confident and comfortable with what you're doing and and comfortable and confident with your horse but the novice championship is based for people who are just starting out and just getting around the course it's not meant for people who are racing flat out you know a lot of what we publicize is of course the elites and the way that they race because it's because it's amazing but the the novice is is open to all all you have to do is your assessment which is very simple for a rider can you basically canter a big figure of eight and for a board rider can you hang on to the horse while it canters a figure of eight effectively in the shortest possible terms now so the growth of the sport is to add more events to our calendar we are moving into some more interesting uh, venues we went to the fei world cup 
dressage in Denmark last year. We took four teams to wow. that, um, which was which was amazing. What on um, earth? Oh, let me just hold you there. What <laughs> on earth were they thinking when they saw you? Their mouths must have dropped because you go from you know really really elite dressage, athleticism, um, and it, and it's, it's very well put together, and it's always the same that we've seen for years. To you guys hollering down a microphone, going, and he's getting around the corner, and he's going to fall <laughs> off, and I'd love to have seen their faces. It was a, the reaction was absolutely amazing. I mean, we went on just after Lorenzo, so we were in very good company. Yeah. And by the third race, I mean, it was one of the one of the proudest moments of my life, really. But by the third race, the uh, crowd couldn't make any more noise. They were screaming so much they couldn't make any more noise. And this was uh, it, all indoors, of course. And um, they so they stopped. They they would continue to scream and cheer and all that sort, but they just started whistling. And the whole crowd just started whistling, and it was just this amazing uproar of sound, and that just went on and on from there on in, really. So, um, yeah, it was a it was a ver- it was a great experience for all the teams that went, and for for ourselves. Um, so, and there is a video actually online, so I'll send you a link to that. Do, <laughs> which we'll is put a, it on horse which hour. Is a full, uh, yeah, um, uh, so there's, a, there's actually a full, it's a full documentary that we, we did for it. But then also we are going out to Holland this year to an event, which isn't an FEI event. It's a, a like a country show festival in Holland and running the championships. And then for next year, you know, we'd love to extend our season into more of the winter venues, indoor winter venue, international shows in this country. But we're also talking to international shows all around the world. So we are, you know, we're, we're keep pushing, um, but keeping our as well our feet on the ground in terms of the national championships and making sure that we can continue to to bring more people into the sport and to make a nice environment for people which is very important to us oh dan i'm getting so emotional for you because <laughs> it's just incredible i can i'm picturing that crowd cheering now and, and knowing you knowing how how much you've grown this or you know you've done all of this and you've kept going you've kept pushing it you've believed in your sport and now to have other people it must be incredible to have you know the top of the industry going this is awesome yeah i mean i think we've still got a bit of work to do with the with the particularly the international i mean uh, the show in denmark is a show which does like to try and find something very different and they're prepared to take a risk as we know from a lot of the fei internationals or international events particularly indoor events their arena time is very precious so they want Mm. to see something as a completely finished product before it goes in there which is fully understandable um so as as great as that event was we're not finished yet we still have a lot more work to do you know i would very much like to go to horse of the year and olympia and liverpool um, for this country, they're on my target list. So's um, your horse live as well. So we need to be <laughs> hammering them with tweets, then, don't we? Saying we need to see because <laughs> we need to see horse board in UK there because it's just like the the Shetland Grand National. You know, that's become a household name across all the major shows, and it would be great to see you guys there too. Yeah, well, I mean, like I say, we've they we've not been going that long in terms. Of, I mean, what do you have to consider about Olympia is that the carriage driving. I only went in there a few years ago, the extreme driving. One of the most, as someone who's worked in, in very extreme environments with horses and uh, done some pretty extreme stuff myself, there's not a lot in terms of horse acts that really, really, really impress me. But that carriage driving, the elite uh, extreme carriage driving at Olympia, blows my mind every mm. time. Those guys are so far on the edge. And I've worked with a lot of carriages in film and TV as well. So like, I, I know that those guys have got something missing you know in the mind to do that stuff <laughs> Incredible, um, <laughs> yeah um so and the thing is that was started in the 70s i believe by prince philip it took about 30 years before it got into olympia so we haven't got the same sort of pedigree so i would expect us to, it would take us a little bit of time uh and, but i'm quite happy for that because all or everything that we're doing at the moment you know the, the with the nationals and with our other events that we're involved in as well is all about you know polishing what we're doing and making the team of guys that are in the back you know the the ground staff um the, what we're doing on terms of the commentary the develop the computer system that, that manages it the uh, the live streaming everything that we're doing is all part of that development so it'll um, i i feel it will happen it's just a matter of time because it will happen i have full faith <laughs> it's got to happen 
If not, we need to make it happen. You also have um, horse boarding. I was going to say horse boarding UK. You also have uh, people doing horse boarding in other countries as well as Holland. You've got horse boarding Australia, I think I saw. Yeah, there's 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 quite a few. Um, so last year in particular, we had an, a lot of uh, a social media coverage, and we and with different magazines and stuff, we reached about eight million people around the world. So that resulted in quite a few orders for our harnesses and for information going out to other countries, so which we've pretty much sent now to all over the world. So there are little groups starting everywhere, everywhere. I had an email actually yesterday from Georgia, the country, as it was put, <laughs> um, saying we want to start horseboarding down here. How can can you help us to set up a club and all this sort of thing? So um, you know, but also throughout. The people in everywhere, everywhere. They're, they're uh, South Africa, America, all across Europe. Um, but they're all in their very, very early baby steps at the moment. Horseboarding UK is the is the the, the largest organisation. Well, horseboarding, well, horseboarding UK should own it all, I think. <laughs> so I hope you've got the IP for the world because it looks like you yeah. need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've, what we do is we run our international events under Horseboarding International. So the future will be that these other countries will affiliate to Horseboarding International. And then any international competitions will, they'll of course have to be following the rules mm. as set out by Horseboarding International and therefore be affiliated to it and so on. Um, so that would be our equivalent of like the FEI or something along those lines one day daniel uh, you will be at yeah. the olympics and we'll say do you remember our conversation when this little stunt man turned into <laughs> an international mogul for horseboarding it's incredible i'm so so pleased for you and uh, i'm really excited about the future for horseboarding and we're going to be following your journeys and some of your riders and your teams and they're going to give us an insight into their world of horseboarding and the training that they do and how they get their horses ready for competitions and things like that and um, we can follow you on twitter facebook and instagram can't we what are your handles um facebook is the best one horseboarding uk the other accounts basically are all linked in so the twitter and instagram and all that they're linked into the facebook account so you'll see stuff on there but really uh facebook's got the up-to-date stuff it's got the videos as they come out it's where we do our live streaming um currently um so it's it's uh, horseboarding uk on facebook yeah now you also need to get your little backside on twitter a bit more we know this so for all <laughs> our twitter fans it's at horseboarding uk and uh, i'm yeah. determined to get you using twitter more so uh, thank you so so much for joining us dan it's a pleasure to talk to you we can head to your website if we'd like to find out more information which is horseboardinguk.org and uh, we can follow you on facebook twitter instagram and hopefully we'll catch up in a few months and you can let us know how it's going would that be okay that'd be wonderful great all right we'll speak to you soon <laughs> thanks dan thank you Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. I really do believe that Horseboarding UK is the most fun sport I've seen for horses in a long, long time. And uh, and if you'd like to find out more information, then you can get all the details at our website, horsehour.co.uk. While you're there, why not pop in your email address so that I can send you lots of advice and education from each of our guests each week. And there's lots of other advice there for you as well, including things on diseases from the vets at B&W Equine Vets, uh, infectious diseases, you can listen to all our previous episodes too of the Horse Hour podcast and you can keep up to date with all the events that we go to. So all the pictures, videos, backstage interviews from Badminton and the Royal Windsor Horse Show are on the website as well as all our social channels which are Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and we're even on YouTube. So there's lots of ways to stay up to date. Next week is very, very exciting because we speak to William Whitaker. He's the nephew of Michael and John Whitaker. He's an amazing show jumper and uh, he's kind enough to let us into his world of what it's like being an international show jumper. Please keep sending your photos because I love to see your journey and uh, see what you're up to. Hope you have a really good week and I'll speak to you soon. You've been listening to Horse Hour. Join the community on Twitter, Mondays, 8 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. Eastern by using the hashtag Horse Hour. Follow Amy at AmyStevenson1 and subscribe to us on Acast, iTunes, Stitcher and Player FM. Horse Hour.